Amen. First Samuel chapter 28. So, as we saw last week, David actually departed from where he was supposed to be, I believe. And David's on an interesting journey. We see it mentioned in the first couple verses there that now he's gone over to Achish, uh, who is the enemy. And we'll deal more with that next Wednesday night. But tonight I want to focus on the, on the majority of this chapter which deals with King Saul and the Witch of Endor. Now there's a famous TV show and then a remake and then another remake of that Witch of Endor. It comes out of the Bible. Uh, it's uh, apparently good enough for a sitcom, but really witchcraft is, is no laughing matter. Uh, I preached recently, hell is not a joke. Witchcraft is not a joke. Saul made some major mistakes in this chapter. He kind of sealed his fate. I want to talk about tonight Saul's sin unto death. And with this thought, as we look at the last and final steps he takes in his career as king, uh, it's going to cost him his kingship. It will cost him his life. It's going to cost him his son's lives. And a lot of other innocent people are going to die because of the foolish decisions he begins to make. We know that he's been full of himself and angry at the wrong people and reacting the wrong way. Uh, so Saul was on this downfall. I often associate him with what the world would call a psychopath or a narcissist. However, I think most people in the world that are that way are children of the devil. And here we see that Saul, as a child of God, has gone so far from the Lord that he actually comes to this point in the chapter where he says it was like, God had departed from him. We'll see also that Saul does go to heaven. We're going to see Saul when we get to heaven. But there is a sin unto death. That sin unto death, we're going to study that concept tonight as we look at this story. A sin unto death is obviously something anybody could do, but in the Bible when it talks about it, it's a warning to believers. Just because you're blood-bought and sealed by the Holy Spirit, that doesn't mean you can't mess up so great that God just brings you home early and terminates your earthly life and enters you into eternity. We're not, it's not the same as the unforgivable sin. And I want you to think about your own life as we look at Saul. What is your sin unto death? I think everybody has a certain line in their life or a conscience issue where they come up to a wall with a conscience or they come up to a line with God and some Christians will cross that line and they will die early. I think everybody has a sin unto death and there are specific sins unto death that the Bible points to. And we're going to look at a few of those and I want you to consider yourself. In 1 Samuel 28, if you will look at verse number 3. Now Samuel was dead and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. I, I, I want to look at this point for one minute here before we really dive into Saul. Why was he putting away the witches and the wizards? What a great question. If you will, go to Leviticus chapter 19. Turn back a little bit. Go to Leviticus chapter 19. Uh, in the Bible, when it uses this phrase, a familiar spirit, that is the terminology we would use today is demon-possessed. A familiar spirit is, you know, the word familiar is like family, right? So this is something that's attached to you, it's familiar with you, oh boy, it's got your number, you're tied into it, you're related to it. Uh, basically, you have become demon-possessed. Most of the people in the Bible that we see that have a familiar spirit are a reprobate. Somebody that has rejected God, rejected God, they've seared their conscience, so God rejects them. They then become a child of the devil, and they are permanently possessed with a demon. Now with Christians, you cannot be possessed. You certainly can be influenced. Once you're saved, you're always saved, and the Holy Spirit will indwell you. He'll be inside of you forever. 
You are always child's God, the, the child of God, right? So there's the children of the devil. Once they cross that line, they're always that way. We're after the children of the world. We want to pull them out of the fire and get them saved. The war is for the souls. The children of the devil are trying to defile the innocent and pull them to sear their conscience. We're trying to get them saved to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll be sealed unto the day of redemption. They're saved forever. Uh, but there is a sin unto death for the saved. Now, Saul, who's going to sin unto death before God, goes to a woman that has already crossed the line with God and sealed her fate. It's like she knows that she's uh, dancing with the devil or uh, selling her soul to the devil, so to speak. I don't really believe that if somebody pulled out a contract and said, sign here, and it says you're going to sell your soul, but don't worry, you'll be a millionaire and you'll get everything you want, and you'll have all the power and riches, and you'll be famous. People will treat you like a god now. I don't believe that the power is in the paper that you signed a legal contract. I believe it's in your heart that you say, yeah, I'm done with God, and the devil can do whatever he wants with me as long as I get what I want now. So there is this issue we have to deal with when you sin against your conscience, cross a line with God. Um, he said in, you stay where you're at, Leviticus 19, I remind you in 1 Samuel 28, 3, he said, Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. The familiar spirits are typically dealing with the women like witches, and the wizards are typically dealing with the men that are, in a sense, their masters or their controllers their handler, if you will, oftentimes an abuser of others or a recruiter for the devil. So the wizardry there, it's interesting, he said he put away those that had the familiar spirits and those that, that were a wizard that were casting spells and spirits and doing all sorts of evil witchcraft. To define it by the Bible, you're in Leviticus 19, find verse 31. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31 Regard not them that have for familiar spirits. Neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. He says, be careful. <laughs> Don't regard them is how he says it. They're going to defile you. So he says, ignore them, avoid them, disregard them. Uh, it would do you well to stay away from people and things like that. And this is very timely with everything that has happened last night. Uh, Hell's Holy Day. Satan's birthday, uh, gay Christmas, somebody told me is what they love to call it. It's a, it's a big LGBT, whatever, holiday. They just love Halloween. It is, their ho it is their holiday. I know the Mormons really love it also. Go to the next chapter. Go to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20. When you get there, find verse number 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits... And after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. God says, I'm going to be angry at you. I'm going to put my face to do harm to you when you go with them and become their whore, in a sense. He says, uh, I will cut him off from among his people. This is terminology the Bible would use, not just separation or segregation. This was a death penalty that it's talking about. Like, you're out of here, you're done, there's a curse on you. Same chapter, Levit Le Leviticus 20, go to verse 27. Verse 27. A man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. He says it's a death penalty. You're doing that, right? Elsewhere it says you should not suffer a witch to live. Can you imagine that? Now look, right, you know, most people say in Florida, oh, if it's a good snake, let it live. We have, you know, uh, you know what's the only good snake? A dead snake, right? <laughs> Especially when it's a rattlesnake, all right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you shall not suffer a uh, rattlesnake to live, or a water moccasin for that matter. If it crosses your path, you kill that thing. Well, that's how God felt about witches and familiar spirits and wizards and witchcraft. He says, ignore them, avoid them. In fact, you should kill them. Strong words. Go to Deuteronomy 18. 
Go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. This is a very serious warning. And listen, I have to tell you, I'll tell you again, uh, Halloween is Satanism, period. It's Satanism. And I want you, as somebody that has the Holy Spirit inside of you, to warn somebody else. If some Christian comes up to you and they say, oh, let me show you the costume. It was so cute. It was funny. You rebuke them. You tell them it's evil. It's wicked. It's spiritual grooming for the devil. And you're preparing children to sell themselves into whoredoms and defile themselves with devils. I don't want my children to be demon-possessed. It's funny. We're going down the road. I don't know where they got it. You know how sometimes kids do their own thing? We're driving down the road, they see some big Halloween thing, and Naomi, probably the instigator on this one, she had all the girls trained, and they all started saying, evil, 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 and I just, I got a big old smile, I'm like, amen, it is evil, that is wicked, that's vile and perverse and ungodly, it's satanic, and we're not going to look at it and say, well, I mean, I wouldn't put it, that's kind of a neat control, no, no, it's evil, God forbid, there's a curse on that thing. You're in Deuteronomy 18, if you will, look at verse number 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. I have to remind you, they would literally be a whore. They would do whoredoms, vile, wicked, satanic, perverse acts, and then when uh, the woman was pregnant, they would take the baby and they would hurt it, they would burn it, they would bleed it. I mean, it, it's ungodly what they did. And they would put their child in the fire. Oh, for a blessing, you know, from the God of the harvest. This is very bizarre. This is our history. I want you to know it's important. It says, or that useth divination. It's called divining. The Bible talks about divining in both a positive and a negative light. When you're searching the Lord for an answer, that's acceptable. When you search for anything else, anywhere else, I'm going to pray to the gods of the trees. Look out, because you're praying to a devil. But all the more when you say, I'm going to throw my child into the fire to Moloch and ask Satan to bless me. Whoa! Be careful what you're doing. It's not as prominent as it is today, although there are people that are openly proclaiming that they're a witch. Uh, who was it just last night at the, at the uh, chili cook-off was telling me about somebody they know for a while, they've been on this thing, and they, they have, do some seemingly wholesome stuff, but they just came out and they said, you don't know how free, how liberating it feels to come out and say, I am a witch. In a time when Christianity is so oppressive, I am a witch, and I always have been. And they've been deceiving people. We live in a time where people want to sell themselves into that. You're in Deuteronomy 18. Look at the next verse in verse number 11. Or a charmer, you know, people that try to uh, sed uh, seduce you or put you in a, a, a seance or, or what's the, uh, hypnotize you. Like there's things that they will try to do, enchant you and charm you and manipulate you and play with your brain and get you to drop your standards and do something you wouldn't normally do. There's a curse on people that do that. He says, a charmer or a consulter, here it is, with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Necro is dead. He's talking about those that would talk to the dead through devils. Now, there is a mixed opinion in Christianity about whether or not they can really talk to the dead. It seems to me from the Bible that you have a familiar spirit. You're permanently possessed with a devil. And that familiar spirit will communicate with, I think, other devils. And then lie to you and make you think that they're really talking to your dead relatives. Or just simply be a lying spirit and convince you that they're your dead relative because they're familiar with things, uh, the things in your life or what you're searching. I, I don't believe that you can that one devil can speak to somebody that's in hell, or a devil can speak to somebody that's in heaven. I think these devils are liars and manipulators and deceivers. Look at verse 12. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. 
You can go back to 1 Samuel 28. So I, I want you to understand why Saul had put away all out of the land that were doing these things, because that's what he was commanded to do. And he was put in a position of authority and power. And as the shepherd of the nation, he said, no, no, no. God said put them to death. Run them out. Kill them. Burn their house. Get rid of them. They're evil. And I mean, if you know the culture, and I'm really trying to keep it mild here, but they would eat children and torture people and bleed them. I mean, and, I mean, it's really bizarre the things that they used to do. So when God came in, He ran part of them out, but then He said, now you run the rest of them out. And He said, whatever you do, don't make marriages with them and don't go with them and don't learn their ways because there's a whole another bucket list of sins that they do that's just vile and perverse and disgusting. The Bible warns about it with homosexuality and bestiality and uh, kidnapping and all those other things. It's tied to Satan worship. That's really the source of it all. And this is not just an Old Testament phenomenon. It still happens today. In the New Testament church in Acts chapter 16, verse 16, it says, And it came to pass, and we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. She had handlers. She had manipulators that controlled her. They put devils on her and used the devils in her to try to tell people the future or whatever, soothsaying to get money from other people. I'll be your fortune teller, give me some money, and I'll take the damsel, that means young lady, that we've put a devil on, and we'll get this devil to give us some information from beyond. Whether it's true or false, they, would, they had a system of profit. Uh, meanwhile, they're hurting this young lady. So Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land, right? And he, had, he hated them as the Lord had hated them. Let's pick up in verse number 4. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Now it's interesting, he mentions three different ways that Saul had sought the Lord. Listen, there are times in your life that you want an answer, and it may seem that God is not answering you. And it may be a trial. It may be the Lord is allowing you to go through a spell of dryness to see if you'll go back to that foundation that's already been built in your heart of the Word of God. Because the thing is, if somebody came in today and they said, hey, I need an answer. Is fornication okay? I do not need a dream. I don't have to cast lots. I really, I don't need to pray and say, Holy Spirit, give me the answer. I need this now. I already know the answer. It's in the Bible. It says no, right? So, I mean, there are, there are certain things that we already know that we ought to just keep that foundation. Now, here's where Saul is really going to mess up. Uh, it says, by dreams, the Lord can speak to you through dreams. Yes, He can. Now, I will warn you that you'll run into people that will say, oh, God showed me something in a dream. <laughs> I believe the Lord has shown me things in dreams, but I don't really go around telling people about it. I think there's some crazy people out there that will come to you and say, I had a dream. God showed me something. He did this, and He did that, and He showed me this, and He told me I need to do that. Uh, really, what did God look like? And we were talking about this earlier, Sister Sylvia and I. Did he, did he crack open the sky and there was light everywhere and he was in a white robe, a dress all the way to his feet and he had long hair and it's like, Arr! wrong Jesus, okay? That's the Catholic Jesus, the Mormon Jesus, the Muslim Jesus. You know, that's a false, that's not the way it works, right? Uh, when God talks to us sometimes, it's through that still small voice, it's through our conscience. And there are times when we're searching the Lord and looking for an answer and trying to find guidance and direction. And we pray and we pour over the Word and we ask God and we ask God and we ask God. And we go to sleep and sometimes it just feels like the Lord confirms something in our spirit. I believe God still works through dreams. I believe God works through Urim, which was like the casting of the lots in a sense. Or we would call it putting out the fleece. How many of you have heard a fellow Christian say, I'm putting out the fleece? 
How many of you have said it yourself? We got a big decision. We need to put out the fleece, right? Have you ever known anybody to actually literally put a fleece outside? Now, wait a minute. Now, do we have that kind of faith from God? Because you know what they do. Uh, now, the story was, he put the fleece out. Lord, show me a sign. You know, it rains just here, but not there. Okay, sh show me a sign. It rains uh, just here, but not there. Now, that's huge. That's a big deal, right? But we say, well, I think I need to do this. I'm going to put out the fleece. Yep, I feel confirmed. That's what I'm going to do. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You just, you just, um, you're going by a feeling? Or are you really trying the Lord in a sense, calling on Him and waning on Him and letting Him show you a sign? Again, the warning about those that are seeking signs and talk about dreams often. We know there's a bunch of phonies out there, but God can still work this way. But then He says, and through prophets, if you notice that in verse 6, and through prophets. Um, I am thankful uh, I, that the Lord counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. I, I'm thankful that there's been many times I would say something or preach something, and somebody would come up and say, you're not going to believe it. We were just talking about this. And then here you are preaching about it. And all I can say is praise the Lord. That means I'm being faithful in my office that the Holy Spirit is guiding me in a direction to answer a question I didn't, I didn't even know existed. That's when God gets all the glory that He works supernaturally. So God works through prophets. And He was inquiring and trying to get an answer. God's not answering him. So what does He do? Verse 7. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Why did they have to seek? Well, because he killed the rest of them. Next verse, verse 8. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. He went down to the Halloween party. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not what it says. Uh, he, he puts on a costume to deceive, and he's going to the witch. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit. Notice, he, the, the, the fam I know you've got a devil in you, and I need an answer. And bring him up, of whom I shall say unto thee. He's saying, speak to me from your demon. At this point, Saul is crossing a line, not just with God, because he you knows he's breaking the law. He's crossing a line in his own conscience. He's doing something that he knows better than he knows he ought not to do. It was probably breaking his heart as he was doing it. He was probably sorely grieved that he was taking part of it, and yet he probably felt like, well, I've come this far, I just have to take this step. I really believe that Saul was searing his conscience, sinning against his conscience, sinning against the Lord, lying against the truth. Like He was crossing a big line right here. And I have to warn you, there is power on the dark side. There is power in Satan's camp. It's not the kind of power we get from God. You'll never get true joy, happiness, love, compassion. You'll never really feel satisfied or fulfilled on that side. Those are things that God gives. There is power. I mean, it will cost you your soul. They're going to defile you in every way they can. They're going to destroy everything, and ultimately it will cost you death. I believe those that play around dancing with the devil, selling their soul to the devil, they know it's only a matter of time that one day they're going to come calling. And they're going to die when they're not ready. They're going to hurt. There's a lot of destruction. But there is power. Don't ever forget that. When you're possessed with a devil, and that devil takes control of your body, and you're no longer driving of your own spirit, you're letting a devil drive, that comes with power. You get power. You get all sorts. You can, you can get puffed up and pride and famous, and there's all sorts of things, spiritual power that comes with it. But it's darkness. It's darkness. Look at verse 9. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, 
how that he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? She says, here I am hiding out in Endor, and uh, here you come. And don't you know that if King Saul finds out that I'm helping you by letting my devil speak to you, then I'm going to get in trouble and he's going to kill me. Why are you trying to get me killed? Don't you know what Saul is doing? How profound she's speaking to Saul and hasn't figured it out yet. Meanwhile, Saul, I mean, all the more. that See, and this is what happens when a Christian begins to cross that line. When a Christian cross, crosses that line and sins against their conscience, they think it'll be okay, they'll be well received, but uh, the other side is going to try them all the more. I mean, he, he, she invoked his name. And he still sinned. It's interesting, I, I do find it interesting that while Saul was doing evil against David, he was doing some bad stuff. He was still being used of God to cut off the wizards and the witches and the familiar spirits. And he was still fighting the Philistines. And he still had some good things going on. But you know, he's cutting off those that are demon-possessed. And then now here he is at the end of his life, and he's going to one that's demon-possessed. Verse 10, And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, <laughs> as the Lord liveth. Can you imagine? I'm going to go to a witch that seared her conscience with God, that has a devil living in her heart, and she says, you're going to get me killed. And you say, I swear by God that I won't get you killed. Wow. I mean, it just shows you that darkness and light do not mix. It makes no sense. And listen, when Christians celebrate Halloween and they justify the perversion that's going on because it's just a little bit of fun, it needs to be rebuked. We need to stand up and tell them and say, listen, light and darkness don't mix. And listen, you want to be some light for Christ? Get the darkness out of your life for His glory. <laughs> Verse 10, And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Who shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. Now, this woman is accustomed to being possessed with a devil. And I think she fully expected, okay, I'll, I'll do my magic ball or whatever the perverse thing I had to do that goes against God. I'm going to do it to get the devil to come out and we'll pretend to get you an answer. Or she doesn't know if she's pretending or not. The devil takes over. He's going to drive her steering wheel, take over the reins of her heart and say some things to this man. She fully expects to either black out or whatever. She's been through this before. But what I don't think she expected was for a prophet angelic messenger, sort of, if you will, a saint from the grave that had already passed on and was with the Lord to come back as a bright, light, good spirit. I don't think she expected a godly spirit to show up. She expected, okay, now the devil takes and I black out and I come back. Or you know, I don't know. We don't know exactly how, what she was expecting, but we know that she did not expect to actually see Samuel. She expected the lying spirit, not the truth. So she was kind of surprised to see a saint. And right away she recognized, she had that spiritual discernment, because it was Samuel, I think there's something else going on that he revealed to her, this is Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Again, there are real spiritual powers today. Don't be surprised that there are people that worship devils that have power in this life but they have no power over the grave. They have no joy. They have eternal torment. So avoid the devils. Fight against this perversion. Look at verse 14. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me? You know, this verse gives me comfort. A friend of ours, Brother Mike, passed on a little while ago dealing with cancer. And uh, we were talking, us guys were sitting around talking after we had a funeral service. For him. He said, I wonder what Brother Mike's thinking right now. Or sometimes we talk, what, what do you think he's thinking? No, no. Here he says, once you're gone, why would, why would you disquiet me? 
I'm with the Lord. I'm in heaven. I don't, you know, leave me alone. I, I'm done with the earth. And we have to remember, as much as we want to hold on to what we have here, at the moment that we depart, absent from the body, present with the Lord, and we enter into eternal glory and joy, we're not really going to be concerned with who is the president or how much silver sells for or what the stock market's doing or how many Teslas catch on fire driving down. We're not going to care about this stuff anymore. We're going to be up there and it's like, oh wow, if only I'd had this perspective while I was there. Saul, who was with the Lord, said, why have you disquieted me? I was in peace, right? He says, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and is become thine enemy? He just kind of reminds him, why are you even asking me? Because you already know the answer. Not only has God departed from you, but because you made him your enemy, God has made you his enemy. And listen, when God makes you your enemy, whether you're saved or lost, it doesn't really matter. It's a miserable existence. Verse 17, And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. So now Saul, this really is Samuel. Because Samuel is saying, hey buddy, do you remember when I told you that this was going to happen back in the day when you rebelled and then you, you didn't obey and you kept having these problems? I told you. Remember you rent my jacket and I said the kingdom is rent from you? It just took some time to play out. I think, I think the Lord might have been patient and long-suffering because Saul was doing some things right. Although Saul was a bad guy in certain ways at the time, God was still using him. And I think David was learning to not be like Saul. I think David was learning how to be a, a great leader instead of a prideful leader. So he says in 17, uh, As he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thy hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because thou... And here he gives the reasons. There's three reasons. There's three reasons Saul's about to die, why God's curse is on him. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord. Okay, so not obeying God. When God reveals something that's very clear to you and you don't obey Him, you've got a big problem because you're sinning against the Lord. Right? Just as a rebellious child, you can give them, God is very kind. Hey, child, do you want to do the right thing? I'd like to give you another chance to do the right thing. Do you want to do the right thing? Now, some Christians will stiffen their neck, harden their heart, blind their eyes, stop their ears. And God will continue to draw them and prick their heart with the Holy Spirit and touch them in their conscience and say, do, don't you really want to do the right thing? I know you know the right thing. And I know you can do the right thing. Saul failed. He was disobedient. You know, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother. This seems like such a simple commandment, but it's such a big one. It's so foundational. It's such a fundamental. It was in the Ten Commandments. It's in the description of those that are rejected of God. Disobedient to parents is one of the descriptive characteristics of somebody that's a reprobate, a child of the devil. And so uh, children, and listen, adults alike, when we're confronted with the authority that God has given us, and we kick against it, we kick against it, boy, there comes a point there where God's going to say, now listen, this is your last warning, and then I'm going to correct you. He says in verse 18, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord. Here is, here's the second error. Nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Amalek was a wicked nation. They were the ones burning children and hurting innocents. And God said, don't spare a one. Everything's defiled over there. Their animals are unclean. Their children are unclean. Wipe it all out. Just do what I said. You don't understand. I do. Do what I said because that's what needs to happen for you to have a pure kingdom. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. 
Finally, he says, Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. And then thirdly, Moreover, the Lord also will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. He says it twice, and that's such a harsh thing. He says, uh, the nation is going to be attacked. Your people will die. You're going to die. Your children are going to die because of your sin. He makes it very clear. Look at verse 20. Then Saul fell straightway all along on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night. Uh, if you would, go to Acts chapter 5. Go to Acts chapter 5. I want to just show you a couple sins unto death and uh, call it a night on this topic, but I, I just want to drive this home. S Sam, Saul sinned by not obeying, not executing God's wrath against the ungodly, but then by divination of a spirit, by searing his conscience when it tells us four times in the chapter, Saul cut him off, and Saul cut him off, and Saul cut him off, and then he's like, well, here I am, I'm Saul, and I'm asking for advice from you. Oh, they're possessed with the devil, get rid of them. They're possessed with the devil, get rid of them. Does anybody know somebody possessed with the devil I can get some advice from? Some counsel? Man, what are you doing? You can't say I didn't know! In 1 Chronicles chapter 10, it tells us again that his death was for asking advice from a demon. Uh, it says in 1 Chronicles 10, 13, So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. That was the rebellion. And also asking counsel of the one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. That's kind of a big deal when you know that something is controlled by the devil and you go and sit down to it anyway. Can, I mean, can you imagine? I remember years ago I was at a friend's house. We were all in college and we were sitting around and another friend shows up and the guy was carrying a Ouija board in his house. He, hey, I got a Ouija board. And he goes to set it down. And now the guy's house we were in, uh, I would not count him as a high quality Christian. I, I, I mean, I, I know when he had somebody passed, he went to church. When he got married, he went to church. I mean, he's not really what I would call a Christian. I was in his house, and this other friend shows up at the house, and one's carrying the Ouija board. Hey, guys, we're just going to... And that guy got, like, furiously mad. I had a lot of respect for his stand that he took, because he's like, no, no, we're drawing a line. That's witchcraft. Satan is, it's not that he's in the cardboard of that game. It's that when you open yourself up to a familiar spirit and you ask counsel of something that you know is ungodly, he's saying, no, I don't want that darkness in my house. What do Christians do? Well, you know, we kind of blur the lines and we go to the things that we know Satan has a stronghold in and we kind of allow ourselves to, you know, dance with the devil a little bit. We don't cross that line, but, you know, we sure do get awful close and kind of look at it sometimes, don't we? There's certain restaurants I'm not interested in going back to or I'll never go. I, you look at, oh, look at this little taco shop. Sounds good. I like some authentic Mexican. And you start looking at it and they've, they've got skulls and inappropriate painted women on the walls and stuff. And it's like, I don't even want to be here. We went to the, uh, what is it, the Sunny's Barbecue down the road on Lane Avenue. We went to it one night after church. We go in there and there was a dude with long hair and earrings and makeup. I mean, everything. And I'm just like, and there's a kid. And I just looked at my wife, and I'm like, we're not doing this. Like, let's just, I didn't, I didn't rebuke him. I didn't yell at him. I didn't call him any names. But I took my money somewhere else. I'm, we're not going to participate in something that honors and glorifies the devil. We're just not going to do it. I'm not interested in it. I'm not going to put up with it. I mean, we've left restaurants for other reasons, too. And I think it is time that Christians get back to taking a stand for what's right and standing on the principles of the Bible and let it be known that you are a Christian and you're doing the right thing. And I'm sorry, I can't participate in that. I'm going to be separate. I don't want, I don't want to be involved in it. I think this is super important. We're talking about a sin unto death. I want you to think about it. He says, there is a sin unto death. And I do not say that he shall pray for it. That's in 1 John 5. There is a sin unto death. And when you see your fellow brother going that direction, there's no hope. 
He says, you can pray if you want, but I'm not going to answer because when they cross a certain line with God, prayers won't fix it. Sometimes they, it's just too, too, they're like going down the slope. Oh no, they're on a crash course. And there they go. There are many times in the Bible that it was very clear that certain things had to, be happen, that had to happen publicly and judgment was executed speedily and publicly. And once the offender was extinguished, it said so that they would hear and fear. If I go sin against God like that, well then that's what I have to look forward to. A sin unto death. There are many sins we could point at that are a sin unto death. Christians can cross a line with God and become what the Bible calls a castaway. A castaway. And God will bring you home early, right? Uh, some fellow saints have destroyed their lives early, and I know some. I, I know some. I believe they were saved, and they are not with us anymore because of their lifestyle. I, I really believe that sometimes God, when He sees His children being the biggest hypocrites out there, and tarnishing His reputation, sometimes He just he brings them home early. Again, the conscience. You're in Acts chapter 5, is that right? Are you guys with me in Acts chapter 5? Acts chapter 5, I want to show you a big one. It's lying to God. We can't lie to God. He knows our heart. If you would, look at verse number 4. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Here they promised a big donation, but then they lied about it. They said they were doing more than they, they're kind of fudging the details so that they look big and they look like, hey, God, I'm the one, I'm the guy that, you know, put my name on the side of the building. I paid it off. You know, I, I laid the fountain, you know, that kind of thing. Like they're, they're given a big thing, but they're really taking more glory unto themselves than they ought to. If you're ever blessed to give a big donation, don't take the glory. Let God give it. He has a huge reward for you. But human nature is we bring that big check out. You know, <laughs> it talks about not letting the left hand know what the right hand does. It's just kind of slipping in the plate. And not, we got an anonymous donation. Wow, it paid off everything. Wow, cool. No, no, our, our human nature is like, I'm coming in. Hold that door for me. I'm bringing my, my check in. I want everybody to see what I'm doing. Right? That's our human nature. It is. And we have to fight against that. Well, here they did that, but they weren't just lying to the people of the church. They were lying to God. He says in verse 9, look at it. Then Peter said unto her, this is the wife. How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. They died because they lied to God. Go to 1 Corinthians 5. Go to 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, this is another very big one. This is usually the number one thing that I talk about when I talk about a sin unto death. There are many titles for this. The Bible calls it fornication. You can call it premarital sex, sleeping around, uh, you, defiling the marriage promise. Now this is very important. This is a big deal. This is not a little thing. In God's eyes, this is a sin unto death. In 1 Corinthians 5, look at verse number 1, it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Fornication is a physical relationship outside of marriage that belongs in marriage, and you take it in your own hands, and you're ruining the blessing that you have. Look at verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Is this person saved? Yes or no? Is he saved? Yep. Amen. And God said, when you come together in the church, this person that's sleeping around and they know it in the church and he's puffed up about it in the church and they're showing off that I'm sleeping around and I can, get a, I can do whatever I want. 
Oh, we're more loving. We love everybody. We'll let everybody in. Well, look, I understand there are broken people that come to God. I, I get that. But there also, there's also those that want to uh, glory in their shame, the Bible says. They want to bring their sin in, and they want you to justify it, and then they want you to partake in it. They want it to be okay that we're going to do something against God's law, and they want to glory, glory in it. God warns us about that. And so that's what this guy was doing. And he says, deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. God says, when this guy walks in the church, I want you to tell him that in the spirit of the Lord, he's kicked out of the church and that hedge of protection is gone. His body is under attack. The devil has full right to attack him and destroy his flesh and to absolutely kill him. I'm going to let Satan kill him. And as soon as he's dead, his spirit will be with the Lord. This is a sin unto death. Sleeping around, playing around with your body outside of marriage is a wicked sin that God hates. Go to the next chapter. Go to chapter 6. Go near the end, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. You're actually, you're actually destroying the flesh that God's given you as part of it. Uh, when, when two come together, it says they become one flesh. This has been scientifically proven that when the physical relationship happens, there are things that, ex that are exchanged that never go back. Like, you're bonded forever. Your body is changed because of that one-time interaction. So in marriage, you become more like each other. He says in verse 19, the next verse, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. He says, you don't own your body. That's God's body, and He wants to live inside of a clean vessel. Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He says, use your body for God's glory, not your own. Go to 1 Corinthians 9. So, I want to ask you, I want you to think about this on your own. What is your sin unto death? I, I do believe there are many sins unto death, if you will, that will cross a line with God that He warns you, He warns you, He warns you, and you cross that line anyway. And He says, now I'm going to have to kill you. I'm going to kill your body, and I'm going to bring you home early because you wouldn't control your body. You let your body defile itself or sin against me. Maybe it's a besetting sin. And I just ask you, is there ever, is there something that God has just revealed to you time and time again? Like, hey buddy, deal with this. Hello lady, you've got a problem here. You need to work on this. You need to work on this. You better deal with this sin. Don't be like that. Don't do that. It, I mean, because I think the Holy Spirit works on people on an individual level. And when He continues to draw us and correct us and He wants to deal with us, I mean, maybe you haven't let the Holy Spirit help you win that battle. Maybe you say, I just can't win. I give up. Do you grieve the Holy Spirit? Do you resist the Holy Spirit? Are you ignoring Him? Look at 1 Corinthians 9. Look at verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Now, God gives us the Holy Spirit so we can control the flesh. You have the power. You have great spiritual power inside of you. You have great spiritual power through the Holy Spirit. He says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He says, I control my flesh in the fear of the Lord. I'm going to walk in the fear of the Lord because why would I try to help somebody and help somebody and help somebody and then I go and ruin it myself? What a foolish thing that would be. And I, we've, we could probably name some names of, of men of God that helped people and helped people and helped people and then they did something horrible. And it's like, ah, well, there he goes. You just ruined the name of Christianity. Helped others and helped others and then let the devil get a victory in his life. If you would go to 1 Timothy 5, and we'll stop right there. Uh, 
In Acts 24, verse 16, it says, And herein do I exercise myself. He says, what kind of exercise do I need as a Christian? Herein do I exercise myself to have always in a, con a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. So here's the goal. Girls, turn around. Here's the goal. Is that we would have a conscience clear with God first and with man also. Sometimes we get puffed up and it's like, well, I'm good with God. I don't know about those people. Right? <laughs> Usually it's we have a problem. Uh, uh, we don't have a clean conscience toward God. I want to warn you. I mean, I could pick on some sins, some visible ones. Smoking and eating and drinking. Smoke, smokers are easy to pick on. And if you're a smoker, I don't know it and I'm not picking on you. Smoking is a very hard sin to break. It is. And I'm not justifying giving into the flesh. But what I want to make sure that as Christians, what we don't do is become a hypocrite. Oh, I see your sin. And sometimes we have worse sins in our heart. I want you to see this in 1 Timothy 5. Look at verse 24. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Right? So what happens? In eternity, in judgment, there's going to be some people where you'll be like, well, that guy was doing that. We had no idea. We thought they were an upstanding person. It, 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 was, it wasn't revealed until eternity. But the majority of people, it's kind of like, oh yeah, I can see your problem. It's real easy to spot somebody else's problem, isn't it? And we don't always want to see our own. And I'm just bringing this up because it's important to be careful about picking on someone else's obvious sin. Be very careful doing that because you have hidden ones that if you resist the Holy Spirit enough, it might become a sin unto death. Pride is one of the biggest. Just thinking you're better than someone else. And can you imagine, you know, because God, He used that example of be merciful to me, a sinner, and you're just beating, oh Lord, I'm just, I'm a wretched, I'm a sinner, I need your help. Then up here you've got the hypocrite. Oh Lord, I'm not like this guy down here. Right? The lesson for us Christians is, oh, I saw that guy smoking. Oh, I know his sin. I heard that he did this. I can see that they're doing that wrong. Be careful. Be very careful about the sins of the heart and the mind. Pride, lust, bitterness, not forgiving people when you ought to. That'll tear you up. Hatred, arrogance. How about a criticizing spirit? You know, there are some people that you meet them and they're always sweet to your face. And as soon as they leave, they just tear you down and they whittle you down and they know how bad and horrible you are. And every word they say, the Lord is counting and saying, stop it, stop it, stop it. That's not the Holy Spirit. Just a criticizing spirit. Puffed up, they think they're better than everyone else. They're arrogant. We have to be very careful about the sins of the heart and the mind. Look at this verse. I want to read it again, verse 24. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. And then, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. I just want to encourage you, let your good works be obvious. Let it not be hid that you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to die to yourself, you're going to control your flesh, there is a sin unto death, and uh, make sure that that doesn't take control of your life. Make sure that you're willing to walk in the fear of the Lord and that you're ready to submit yourself. It's your reasonable service, isn't it? Isn't it your duty just to bring yourself as a living sacrifice and say, God, I know I have things in my life I need to work on. Show me and then help me and give me the strength to do it. Help me to be patient with those that have problems. Instead of tearing them down, help me to build them up and pray for them and encourage them in the Lord. It's very important that we don't just judge by appearance. What did Jesus say? You're judging an unrighteous judgment. Some men's sins are obvious. Be careful picking on those because you probably have some hidden ones. There is a sin unto death, and the, real, the big ones are obvious. The fornication, 
sleeping around while you're not married, God will kill you for that. Beyond that, there are others when you cross a line in your heart and sear your conscience and ignore God, sometimes He may take you out early. I just want to encourage you to figure out what your sin unto death is. You say, Lord, do I have a particular weakness? If so, through the power of the Holy Spirit and for the glory of God, let's strengthen that so we don't fall. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. And Lord, we are all weak in certain ways. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us to remember the story of Saul so that we don't fall. Lord, I pray that you would help us to encourage each other and lift each other up. Lord, when we find ourselves criticizing our brothers and sisters, I pray that you would give us the spiritual strength to pray for them and help them. Lord, I love you so much, and I'm very thankful for what you're doing in this church. I just ask that you would give us the wisdom to do it a way that pleases you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.